Hello, minions. It is I, Ace-Eric. I'm taking a quick break from looking into this whole OGL thing to partake of some mild entertainment. Yes, that's right. I've gone to see the new Dungeons & Dragons movie, and I'm here to give you the opinion you should have. Mine. <laughs> Spoiler free, minions. Now, normally, being evil, I'd spoil the hell out of a film, but times change, and so must I. It seems that the status quo is to spoil things willingly, so I shall instead keep the spoilers from you. <laughs> Just my delicious and eagerly anticipated opinion. Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves is the first D&D movie we've had since 2012, when the last ill-fated attempt to make a D&D movie was spewed from the south end of a northbound owlbear. This film sports all of the usual Tinseltown trimmings, pretty effects, pretty actors, and pretty puerile. The cast is typically efficient for major Hollywood productions, and the writing is perfunctory. That's not bad, per se, and it's most certainly not of the so-bad-it's-putrid quality of the 2000 outing. But let's just say that Shakespeare won't be looking over his shoulder at an up-and-coming replacement anytime soon. There was a tendency to spew an obscene amount of exposition in lieu of actually finessing information through character and action. Seriously, Minions, that's writing 101. Show, don't tell. We are told Edgin's character backstory of love and tragedy. We are told that Doric is hated by humans for being a tiefling, though we never actually see evidence of this. Quite the opposite. It seems that every race under the sun all live together in harmony. It begs the question of why tieflings don't fit into a world where literal dragon people and birdmen walk around and interact with society. It kind of evokes the adage among us dandy enthusiasts, humans with funny hats. This refers to players who demand a variety of races to choose from, but offer no nuance. They simply play them all as normal people, not alien creatures with different cultures and thought processes. The setting was rife with various D&D races prominently featured and all acting distinctly human, with human traits and foibles. And what's the point in having multiple races only to have everyone act in a homogenous way and not to showcase the diversity? This movie is clearly marketing to as broad an audience as possible while attempting to lure in those familiar with the brand. Not a stupid strategy by any means. But I feel that playing it safe here is unwise. When telling a story, one can have their cake and eat it too. You can be thought-provoking and interesting while still being fun and engaging, though it takes skill. One thing I will commend the makers for, however, is giving the audience the rough feel of D&D games as they are played in the current paradigm. The world of this movie certainly felt like the world that would result from the sterile, boring, and deliberately inoffensive world of modern D&D games. But, if I'm also being fair, the film was light and distracting in a fun way. I didn't hate it. I chuckled. I laughed. I was never completely bored, but I doubt how often, if ever, I will watch it again. And that's disappointing, because great potential for storytelling certainly lies in the D&D brand. One need only look over to the legend of Vox Machina for a D&D-based product that's fun and compelling, and ostensibly based on actual gameplay. Vox Machina is flawed, but I enjoyed it far more than I did this movie, though my discussion of Vox Machina will have to wait for its own video. The point, of course, is that the D&D movie isn't really anything different from other movies out there. It's just another fantasy, with D&D references thrown in for garnish, but they don't give it enough of a unique feel. The cast is good, I'd definitely watch them again. Chris Pine plays regretful former Harper Edgin, seeking a very decidedly real and relatable goal, to reunite with his daughter and put his family back together after some tragedy. Michelle Rodriguez does her sour, tough girl act as Barbarian Holga, and aside from a questionable line delivery or two, I really liked her. She sold the role. Hugh Grant does his nervous charm shtick as a former ally and now antagonist, a slimeball you can't help but want to watch. The scenes with the paladin Zank are also highly enjoyable. I couldn't help but wonder if he was meant to represent a DMPC, an overpowered favorite who outshines the main group. If that's the case, then props to the writers on that one. Though from a narrative perspective, his choice to leave the group right before their main conflict seems very unpaladin-like. 
So that was utterly stupid and makes no sense on a character level, especially since he knew who their enemy was and would want to stop her, even if none of them knew the full extent of the diabolical plan. I found myself more interested in some of the smaller character moments and interactions and wished they had more of those. I quite liked the dynamic between Holga and Edgen. I believed they were friends, brought together by their own tragedies. They had an ease and banter, and you knew they'd kill or die for one another. And they do. Oops. Spoiler. <laughs> Don't look at me in that tone of voice. I am evil, after all. You can't expect me to completely behave. The only character I didn't gel with was Doric the Druid. Sophia Lillis's performance wasn't in question, just the writing she was given. She was a non-entity. And there's the rub. As I mentioned before, she's a tiefling who is apparently hated by humanity and therefore dislikes humans. But why? None of that impacted the story or events in any meaningful way. They might as well have just made her human and not brought it up. This is where the movie fails and paradoxically succeeds. It's right in the end credits, based on Hasbro's Dungeons & Dragons. It very much exemplifies their version of it. A general lack of writing nuance, with some exceptions along the way, to be fair, kept reminding me of how most Hasbro D&D games run. Playing through the beats of a Dungeon Master's pre-written narrative with no input, just waiting for it to conclude. Of course, I am aware that's true of all movies, it is what it is, but the writer's job is to make you forget that as you're whisked along on the journey. Not to remind you that you're careening along an obvious rail to a completely anticipated conclusion with no impact or meaning. Worse to remind me of the horrible D&D game experiences that are pretty much the same. But as an adaptation success, I guess? Call it a Pyrrhic victory, I suppose. On that note, as an adaptation, they get elements of the rules wrong. I understand the need to take creative liberties, sure. But compelling action and conflict comes from creating a narrative within parameters and rules, rather than ignoring them. It's even mentioned in the movie that magic can't just do anything. If Sophina the Wizard casts Time Stop, a ninth level spell, she is therefore minimum 17th level of experience. Simon the Sorcerer attempting to counterspell means he's at least a 5th level. And I note they don't go out of their way to make the distinction between sorcerers and wizards. For Simon to confidently cease her time stop without fail, which, spoiler, he does at one point, means he too must be of 17th level in order to burn that 9th level slot. And yet, he's portrayed as a lacking and inept sorcerer incapable of harnessing his abilities for the most part. Sure, Simon finding his confidence is a personal journey and that works on many levels, so this sort of thing won't bother the average audience member, but it does stand out like a beacon to those in the know. Why not craft a situation around the limitations imposed by the rules of the game? Which, it cannot be stressed enough, are also the rules that bind the world you are portraying. The world-building is weak, with references to Forgotten Realms lore being nothing more than lip service. Further, it started to feel more like Harry Potter than Dungeons & Dragons. There was even a parchment with moving images. And let's not mention the Sending Stones acting like walkie-talkies. Or how about those hot air balloons? Ugh, and the characters talking in a modern-day vernacular doesn't help either. It's just lazy writing. Though I do admit, it was fun seeing Thumbershoud get a big-screen debut with a big lug. That boy has become chunkier since I last saw him. Hmm, I shall endeavor to visit the next time I slide into his dimension. Maybe take him a Weight Watchers pamphlet. So, do I recommend Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves? More importantly... Would you trust my recommendation? <laughs> will I say it's good only to drag you to a crappy film? Or will I tell you it's bad and deny you a fun experience? Hmm? I will say only this, millions. Entertainment is in the eye of the beholder, and you won't be seeing any of those on this go-around. So you'll just have to find what joy you want out of it. Keep your expectations low and you'll never be disappointed. That said, I enjoyed watching it once. It was a reasonable matinee-style popcorn muncher. Make of that what you will. I don't regret watching it, but I'll have forgotten all about it soon enough. It's not Lawrence of Arabia or Casablanca. <sighs> I long for the return of such greats. 2.5 stars. Not awful. Fun enough if you don't think about it too hard. That's it, minions. I'm done. 
You can go see the movie or don't. I don't care. I must return to my research on the OGL controversy. I really did miss a maelstrom, didn't I? Serves me right for playing with my food and not paying attention. Until later, minions.